Okay, is this working? I've been having, sorry guys, I'm having problems with OBS. I don't know if it's working. Um, that sucks, because we had like a bunch of people in the lobby and they all got booted because OBS is not working. Um, all right, well anyway, we'll, we'll, we'll start from here. Hopefully people will rejoin. Um, oh nice, Lydia's here, that's good. Okay, so I am live, I think. Yeah, sorry. OBS OBS uh sucks and it like it it like immediately like crashed when I tried to to like uh fix it, all the problems I was having. Anyway. Um well anyway, for those of you who are here, we can just jump right into it, I guess. Um Let me real quick. Let me delete. Uh, let me delete the old file, so that people don't uh, click on the wrong one. One sec. Um, anyway, this is the joys of uh, of trying to be both a comic creator and like a broadcast producer, is that we're asked to wear too many hats, and uh, we, sometimes we have to figure it out on the fly. All right, hang on. I just got to delete old VODs that got created when OBS crashed so that I don't confuse people. And then we'll jump into it. Anyway, so, okay, good. We got everybody back. Um, so yeah, so Lydia is here, which is awesome. So if you want to actually ask questions of uh, not just me, but the person who actually drew the line art. So even though we're going to be coloring, um, we can you can ask questions of the person who actually did all the inking, penciling, inking, like page layouts, panel designs. So that's like amazing. Because um, I think people often have a lot of questions on like the parts that I can't always answer, you know, like the actual, like how to draw certain things or how to use a dip pen or all that stuff. So if you have any of those questions, uh, hit Lydia up, she's in the chat. All right, cool. So this is, once again, I actually have this spread out of order. I have the page, uh, page 14 on the right and page 15 on the left, but this is a spread that I'm working on. Uh, I've sort of made some progress on on page 14, but I might try to do page 15 at the same time because I it's like it's basically one one spread that's a self-contained little like scene. So I kind of want to use the same colors from from 14 on to 15 as I go. You know what I mean? Like I kind of want I don't want to get too far on creating this one and sort of forget to develop this one because I really really want them to match in every way like from a color story perspective. So um, I might actually start by just porting over some of the colors here while I'm in the mind, like the flatting mindset so that this one uh, on the left, page 15, is like similar, it like matches it. Um, <laughs> Omen Heart is like, huh, I forgot about this channel. That's fun. Um, what does that mean? I, how long ago did you find us? All right, so this, this sequence is a dream. It's like a dream sequence. So it's intentionally like quite surreal. I think we're... Um, we're going to do like a lot more colorful stuff than you would normally do, maybe. Um, the main inspiration for this sequence in particular, I've been reading a comic called uh, The Many Deaths of Layla Starr. So for those of you who, who know what that is, it's, um, 
it's like a really interesting kind of like surrealist story, but the coloring is like really over the top and colorful. So I'm kind of trying to bring some of that, that spirit into this. Um, but let me, let's actually sample some colors over here and get them ported over to the page on the left so that the spread matches. Because you can see I started with just like a yellow, orangey, like a tangerine color going to like a sky blue color. So that's like an interesting base that I'll put over here. So let's start there. Sometime in September or sometime in November. I think our biggest um, months, in, like in terms of growing this channel were we're like, yeah, like September, October, November last year, we were getting like 40,000 subscribers a month. It was pretty wild. So like, I'm sure most people found us then. All right, so there's that. We'll start there. Again, I'm just trying to like match everything in some way. Like they don't need to be like super matchy matchy, but I do want them to kind of like have really similar color stories. It might be cool if it was reversed actually here. I think that's the way to do it. Oops. I'm still get, so I'm still getting used to Photoshop changed how the gradient tool works. I'm still trying to get used to that. Now in Photoshop, the gradient tool is more like Illustrator where you can like change your gradient afterward. This doesn't mean anything to people who um, don't use Adobe, but it's pretty, it was a pretty wild change. I know you can use the like classic gradient, but the, the default now is to have like a, this weird, like it's like an illustrator or InDesign gradient where you can like change it after the fact. So I feel like I've been, so I've been using Photoshop since 2002. And I feel like just the last like two years, they've added stuff every six months that like fundamentally changes my workflow. Like they've really, they need, they need some chill, man. They're really intense on the uh, the program changes lately. Yeah, I think this will be cool. I think I think this will be really cool if if the gradients are reversed here, so that on this page it goes blue or purple to blue to orange, and on this page it goes orange to blue to purple. Yeah, this uh, infinite for infinite for this is like a sequence I haven't shown before. It just happens to be what I'm coloring, so I was like, ah, I might as well stream it. I'm not like super worried about spoilers because I feel like we've shown a bunch of pages, but it's pretty impossible to figure out what the hell is going on because our comic is so weird, so I don't know. There are there are still pages that we haven't shown we haven't shown and will never show, but this sequence is like it doesn't really explain <laughs> exactly what's going on because it'll make this this sequence makes you think that it's like a pirate story and it's not. There's just a pirate ship in this particular scene. Uh, the best part of this page on the right is this halftone pattern behind the like water skiing pyramid of pirates. So you got your like tower of pirates here. And I've made videos about this before where if you just throw a pattern or a texture on the background and not on the subject, it adds like so much pop to them. So it, like really, it's not just a color difference that makes them pop. It's like a textural, a textural variation that makes them pop. Um, so we'll bring that in at some point, but most important is to bring in this little color shift here. And 
I'll grab both layers. So I'm gonna, again, I'm just like dragging layers across so that I can match um, exactly what I was doing because this spread will sit together. So when the comic is open, I don't want there to be like any, any doubt at all of exactly like, you know, how this, how this works. Ooh, that's cool though. Like I don't want there to be any doubt that these pages match, you know what I mean? So when people pick up the final page or the final issue and they get to this spread, it's like very clear that this is a self-contained self -contained dream sequence, you know what I mean? So one way to make sure that people understand it's the same scene is to use the same colors in the same color story. Let me just check image size. Okay, so this one, for those of you who are wondering, uh, this is the size we work at. We work at 11 by 14. So it's, uh, 11 by 14 is like, it's pretty big. It's actually not as big as the standard 11 by 17. If you make American comics um, and you go buy like Bristol board comic paper, comic making paper that has like the blue lines on it already, like the bleed and trim. I think it's an 11 by 17 sheet. So Lydia actually works like slightly smaller uh, because the proportions of our comic are different than it. it's it's a, a wider format than the average American comic. It's it's uh, what they call magazine size. It's the color. I don't know if you can see that or it's the same size as this. This is an old issue of a uh, heavy metal magazine and it's bigger, right? It's like an eight by 10 and a half. That's the size our comic is. So we, we set up our files in a slightly different proportion than most people. It's like a very, it's a very old format. Like it's not as common anymore. It was more common in like the seventies. So I'm just checking to make sure that I have the settings right. Yeah, okay, so they match. So these two, for some reason, I thought I might have messed up the sizing on uh, one of these pages. But as long as the pages um, are the same size, you can totally like drag and drop all the elements across, and everything will match perfectly. So yeah, I like this. I like that it's like a spread where it's like a reverse gradient, where the gradients match, but they're reversed. Yeah, people always ask where we sell our stuff because we're always sold out, which is, I guess, a good problem to have. But it's, uh, yeah, it's been tough, man. Keeping keeping things in stock has been a lot harder than I expected. Um, All right, so that's good. And then I think, um, I think it might be cool to do some kind of like overall gradient across these panels. So like if, if the panels are maybe I'll actually, let's try something. Let's try masking out every single panel so that the because it'd be kind of cool if this page on the right was a full bleed page with that gradient full bleed, but then the page on the left here, the gradient was only inside the panels and you just saw the paper texture in the background in the gutters. So let me try that. Let me try to mask out the panels and see how that feels. But yeah, you can see how much Lydia, how much detail Lydia put in this page where there's like this like water skiing tower of pirates and <laughs> they all kind of have different costumes like they're like they're like wearing like classic old Holly, old hollywood like pirate outfits you know with the striped pants and the the vests and stuff it's really funny and then we sort of have our sequence where her arm like withers and shatters which is like very weird and surreal so that's what this is right here I think this sequence was like subconsciously inspired by 
the third Indiana Jones movie, The Last Crusade, where the guy drinks from the wrong cup and like ages a million years in 30 seconds and his body like turns to dust. That's that's I think what the subconscious influence. If I had to guess like where this came from in our brains, it's probably OG Indiana Jones trilogy. Where the guy is like this is a king's cup. And he drinks from the like really ornate gold cup. And then he like his hair grows really long and then his body rots away and then he turns to dust and then he falls on the floor and he just explodes and disappears. It's like absolutely a foundational memory in my <laughs> young brain as somebody who was, I don't know, being introduced to film and storytelling around the time that uh, the Indiana Jones movies hit VHS tape. So I guess you can say this is our little tribute to that sequence, of like the withering dust exploding body. Um, there's also a lot of like severed heads and disembodied heads in this comic. I don't know where that comes from. Probably like old, yeah, like things like, uh, I was just watching the Lord of the Rings movies. There's a lot of like orc heads on stakes. Um, <laughs> maybe maybe like Conan the Barbarian kind of stories like a lot of horror movie Italian horror movies from the 70s and 80s just a lot of severed head vibes and that has carried through uh, to this comic pretty much as well um, yeah people ask I would say the most common question uh, Omen Heart is what software I use. Um, I think people people think that like if they use the software I do, it will help them make comics. But um, I I actually don't necessarily recommend Photoshop as your first ever art software. To be honest, because it's pretty complicated and it's uh, kind of costly. So. Um, you can use this is Photoshop but a lot of people recommend um, Procreate or Krita um, is there another one that everybody recommends it's usually oh Clip Clip Studio most people recommend a lot of people are switching to Clip Studio including like Comic book professionals are like recommending that lately. Um, I think Clip is starting to like really eat into the Adobe market in terms of like art programs. A lot of people who do manga swear by Clip as like uh, the best option. All right, so I want the, if I'm gonna do this where the panels are like masked, masked out, I don't know. We might have to ask Lydia's opinion since Lydia's in chat. Um, if there should also be like a color just behind the panels or if it's cool to leave it like this like pulpy yellowy paper. I like it either way, I'm not sure. I'm pretty sure Procreate is, I think Procreate can do anything that you need for like, if you're doing, like if you're printing, I think it can output it like 300 DPI and and everything. I Photoshop is better for like really, really nuanced stuff. Like if you, if you were to need to like actually print photos in addition, if you're like some of the pages of your comic had photos in them, I don't know why you would. Like if, if there was a, a thing where you were gonna show like a, a uh, behind the scenes uh here's here's us working like here's some photos of our workspace or something like photoshop is obviously much better for like that kind of thing where you actually need to edit the photos to get them ready for like print because it's more than just you know pixels on the page you actually have to adjust like the brightness and contrast and the density and stuff like that so but i think procreate if you're just making comics i think procreate can do can get files ready for print like perfectly
All right, so if we're gonna do this where the, fo the panels are like clipped out, I want there to be more of this like orangey pink gradient poking into this panel with her head. I feel like that's like a good transitional panel where you see the gradient change. In fact, I might make it more of a severe change. Yeah, that's kind of cool. This is like a sunset actually. I didn't even mean to do that. This is another like subconscious influence. Like Lydia and I are from Albuquerque and New Mexico is like known for having like beautiful, amazing, colorful sunsets. I feel like this is like a total Sandia Mountains sunset palette right here. Yeah, I've, I've said this before, like people always ask about art supplies and programs and all that stuff. And uh, I think I've talked to, to you, Lydia, about this, but I really want like, I really want to start making more like long form videos but I really feel like you have to have like a really good hook on your long form videos, like, cause it's a much different, it's a much different pacing, obviously. Um, so I really was thinking that like a cool, a cool idea for a longer form video is like, we made a comic with nothing but a single ballpoint pen. Like to prove that you can make, and it would be like, we would make like one page or a spread or something. Like after we, <laughs> after we finish issue three, obviously. But like, you could make a whole video where you like, document me writing it out the script with the ballpoint pen on like a yellow legal pad. And then you could like, it would be even funnier if like I mailed Lydia the pen in the mail so that the, the joke of the video or like the conceit of the video was like, we used this pen to make the whole comic. And like, I like wrote out the script mailed you the script with the pen you like took the same pen like did the roughs then drew the final artwork then like scanned it and then like lettered it or something like lettered it and pasted down the lettering like whatever like i think it'd be cool to show that like hey everybody asks us what we yeah like 24 hour comic vibe yeah exactly like everybody asks us what you have to use to make good comics well the answer is actually like the skill of the creator you know what i mean and to prove it here's like that we made a comic with nothing but a ballpoint pen Yeah, subliminal, subliminal gutters. Okay, we'll we'll put a color back here. Maybe that green, because I think this page on the right is going to end up getting a lot more green as we work on it, because it'll be like, uh, it'll it'll be like, kind of like, this parrotfish will be green, but I think there's going to be a lot of green elements in like the tentacles and stuff here. Like, see all this, all the detailing here? Like, that's probably all gonna go green. Like, the blocks could, there's like a snake and dragon heads and stuff. So I wonder if, to like match that green, I wonder if you put it all, you put it all in the gutters on the page on the left here. Yeah, I feel like if we do that video properly, the, the, the ballpoint pen comic challenge, and like, we actually, film it properly and edit like I feel like that's a solid like 20 25 minute video that's like a million views like I've, I sort of feel like I've got the vibe for like how YouTube videos should feel to sort of feel both like specific and yet accessible and I feel like that's like a really solid conceit like a really that's a really solid like thesis for a video it feels like people there's enough accessible about it that people who don't know comics would sort of like it um I think it would be really cool All right, just for fun, we'll put a green in the background, but I'm gonna use a halftone brush. I'm sure we'll change this later. Oops, wrong one. I'm gonna put a green in the panel gutters, but I'll use a halftone brush just to give it a little bit of variation. All right, so I'm just using a True Grit, a True Grit texture supply brush. Uh, I think it's called the Beat Tones. Shout out True Grit Texture Supply. Um, if you are interested in making comics, they are, True Grit is like, so for reference, the only, the only brushes I use are default brushes, default round brushes, just like round pressure brushes um, and True Grit brushes. So I've got like a set of these halftone shaders 
Um, I've got a set of like grunge distress brushes, but that's the, that's another thing everybody asks is they ask like what uh, they ask like what brushes they should use, and, and honestly, like you can that's a sort of like the ballpoint pen. Like you can use mostly very simple brushes if you actually know what you're doing. It, I think it actually looks better. I think. I think not being like overwrought with too many brushes and too many different shapes in your in your coloring, like I think that's actually like the secret. It's sort of like uh, you can use a lot of brushes, but it's sort of like being a filmmaker who uses too much CGI. It just kind of starts to look like a little fake and overdone. So I uh, I don't necessarily think you need a lot of fancy brushes, but I do think that having some like old school basic textural brushes like half tones or like simple xerox grunge like that's the kind of stuff that really makes pages uh work my photoshop is totally loving this uh me doing half tones over a huge area that's the one thing i've noticed with using uh the true grit brushes are actually really sophisticated because there's they do more than just paint a pattern on there's like uh, jitter and variation as you use them and the problem is it's actually there's a lot of like processing required to the reason they look so good like if I zoom in the reason that these look these true grit halftones look so good is there's actually like a lot of variation and and uh, the randomness that makes it look like an actual old printed 60s comic but the problem is that if you're using if you're using it over a large area like I am here where I'm like painting across like a huge you know 11 inch wide page at full resolution, it takes like a lot of processing power to get that like jitter and variation. So that's the one, you kind of have to have a computer that can handle it, uh, or you just get a lot of like rainbow wheel of death or whatever it's called. So again, this is, I'm gonna change this probably, but I thought that like maybe a maybe like a gradient would be perfect here. Just like a gradient to green, just to give it like something, you know what I mean? Like just to give it like a like a little bit of character, and then it f fades into this like, from this blue into this like warm. So there's a lot of like complementary colors going on on this page that are actually really nice. I've got Illustrator open and it's also killing my computer, so let me shut it down. There you go. Okay, that's better. That's much better. My computer was like dying trying to run both Illustrator in the background and Photoshop. Um, so at some point, the. Uh, at some point, we are going to be lettering this book which means that a lot of the the streams will turn into uh lettering streams which will be really fun so we'll be an illustrator actually like doing comic lettering live which will be really fun Ooh, that's nice i like that i mean maybe we do just like go full green it's a pretty intense that's a pretty like that's a choice right there it's this these pages are starting to get rainbow but if we can keep them under control it'll be very like it'll feel very like intentional very like uh the other colorist that really inspires me besides ah oh, man who does layla St the colorist who does layla star is a uh, big influence and of course i can't remember their name right now but the other one is um james stoko james stoko does a comic called orc stain he's also done like some cover work for Mar marvel comics that's really good but he uses like a lot of very intense rainbow colors but he has so much understanding of like color theory that he makes it all work nice ash uh they they give you motivation to draw that's good well if you ash if you have questions of the actual line artist lydia's here so make sure to hit her up um and Mary, Mary's here too, so Mary helps run a bunch of stuff for Bad Ink, so, and can answer questions also. 
if I'm like uh, in the middle of coloring and I'm distracted and I'm not reading your question, you can like also ping Mary and say, hey, <laughs> tell, tell him to answer my question. All right, so let's color some stuff. I think that this is like a kind of an interesting beginnings of a spread. Um, it's super weird how much the color changes as you work. So like, oh, and just for fun. So here's the one on the right here. I'll show you how much color already is affecting your perception of this page. As we develop it, it'll actually, it looks right now like, um, there's one, there's kind of one color story to this page, right? There's like basically a pink to blue to pink again, kind of like vibe to the whole page top to bottom. But as we actually develop the color story more and more and more and put more and more details in, it's actually gonna get much more sophisticated than just one overall gradient. Um, but you can see how far it's come if I go here. That's where it started, that's like no that's like the very beginnings, right? So that's pure line art. So you can actually see how much uh, detail Lydia puts into the line art. Um, and then already your perception of it like changes quite a lot with, oops, with where we get where we got to. Let me do that one more time. So there's no colors. There's colors so far, and this will and your perception of it is going to continue to change. The colors are going to get a lot more nuanced. Um, Yeah, let's just dive into it. So this is what I was working on right before I started the stream was this burst here um, behind her. And I think it's a little subtle, like this burst might have to go more yellow versus just orange, but we'll see. Yeah, I don't... I would not recommend Illustrator. I've I have in the past tried to be like a I have tried to make comics where I've used Illustrator like a vector art program as my line art. Like I've actually drawn with a Wacom. Oops. I've drawn with a Wacom into Illustrator as my like line art. And I've tried to actually like then import that line art into Photoshop and color it. And honestly, like it's better to just, it's better if you're gonna do digital line art, it's better to just use Photoshop or Procreate or Clip Studio, any raster based program. It's, it's really, there's really no major benefit to trying to work in vector if you're actually doing like the art for your comic. Illustrator really is meant for like design and like, like logo design, um, like, like lettering, like graphic design versus actual like production art, if that makes sense. So the bad ink logo that's like our profile picture, that was done in Illustrator. Um, the interdimensional title plate, like f at the top of our comics is an Illustrator graphic. But all of this line art is, is what they call raster. It's like pixel based. Like if I zoom in, you can see like everything is made of pixels which is what Procreate, Clip Studio, Photoshop do, and it's fine. As long as you're working in like a high resolution, like it's, there's no reason to try to do your comic as a vector. How do you make the boxes so interesting? Oh, you mean like the panel borders? Oh, you just have to, you just have to give yourself permission to make them interesting. Like, you know what I mean? I think most people think that comics are just like squares with white gutters between them but i think one of the strengths of our comics is that lydia just knows that you can push it you know what i mean like just knows that the panel layout is an art form in and of itself that you can play with it that you can start to like change the shapes or add 3d elements and like really think of it as like a like a layout exercise versus like just a standard formula template of boxes that you have to use All right, so let's yellow this splash up a little bit.
See, okay, so this is where it's hard to make decisions like this without like more context. Like I might have to develop the panel above it to start to understand what I want to do because this is interesting. Like see how the the burst, so this is where it was. It was a little bit more pale, this like burst of energy around her. Um, if I turn it on this adjustment layer, it pushes it like really far, like it's pretty intense. Right now it feels like too much, but it might actually feel better. This might feel more appropriate if when I develop this, pa this panel above it, there's a lot of colors and this actually bright, this brighter orange or this brighter yellow actually helps balance it out. I don't know. So I'm gonna leave it off for now and just finish flatting out the character and then we'll work on this panel and then we can come back and start to tweak colors because then we'll have this like context of how much color is too how much color is too much color because how much color are we using in other parts of the page you know what i mean it's really hard to make choices in isolation at least for me i'm not able i'm not able to do one panel at a time i have to like work on pages and develop pieces of them and start start to use that to inform how saturated things get in certain parts all that I also don't know what color to make things, but we'll just make the book or the tome. It's the tome, right? Spoilers, that's what it's called. It's like the MacGuffin of our story. Um, I'll just make it green for now. One thing, so I've been reading The Many Deaths of Layla Starr. I'm a really big fan of James Stokoe's Orc Stain. I guess to some extent, JoJo's Bizarre Adventure, which is the one everybody probably will know and our our audience tends to like lean pretty heavily towards like manga and anime but all of those references are things that are like really colorful like very surreal um, and all of them use non-literal coloring where instead of making this book like leather colored brown um, there's like an overall color story so the book and the character all have a green tint to them which is the secret to being able to use a lot of colors on the page but not having it feel like just like a vomit of funfetti is there's actually like consistency of color across an entire figure and everything that they're touching and interacting with if that makes sense and that's definitely something that i learned from yeah from things like uh the many deaths of Layla Star or Jojo's Bizarre Adventure. And then I always keep other pages open that I've already done for reference. So just I want to see how I've colored this character before now. So I've got her on the right here in development. She's so her outfit changes, but I want her to always have like a consistent color story. So I want to always kind of see like even though her outfit's changing and she's going to be colored slightly differently like I want to see the choices I made last time so I kind of understand what to do with her. One thing that might be good is to keep her hair her hair consistent, which means I'm actually going to have to change the color of her armor or at least this part of her armor right here. because her hair is gonna cross behind her and it's gonna be the same color as the scale male. So we'll actually, let's do the scale male as like a pink color. It's gonna get, this one's gonna be really tricky. I'm actually like scared to do this live because we're playing with like quite a lot of colors that are gonna start to run together. There's, there's a lot of like balance and nuance to this. Hopefully it'll be informative for those of you who are watching it's going to be difficult to nail this first try. It's going to take a lot of like tweaking as we go. Oh, 
I wonder if her armor is, uh, is her armor TOS? It's just a drawing, right? It's like a, it's like those Roman armor, like the, the ornamental Roman armor that has like abs on it, right? It's just anatomical armor. And it's just a drawing of it, right? That's not TOS, right? I didn't think about that before I started streaming this page. This is like our most uh, heavy metal cover page. I feel like every, this this would like I feel like Lydia really channeled like like Richard Corbin for this one. This is like a real seventies arm like lady armor vibe. And then of course this character has like magnificent hair that's very uh, majestic. All right, let's change, let's change the color of her armor just for now, just so we don't get confused. God, this is cool though. So again, this is, this is very, this is the kind of, I'm talking about like the people who influence my coloring. Um, James Stokoe is like a really big influence for what I'm doing right now, where I'm intentionally, um, it doesn't really make literal sense why someone's armor would go from green to pink like this. But from a color theory perspective, there, there are secondary colors that go together really well, and you can start to just play with the surrealness of it. And I, I he's, James Stokoe is like an absolute master at at that at like he uses so many gradients of suppose what should look like crazy rainbow colors but because he's so clever with what color touches what part of the drawing like he he makes it all work I, i'm nowhere close to being able to 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 work at his level but i am trying to kind of like borrow slash steal some of his uh ideas Oh, what up? It's Mr. Woods. It's M. Yeah, fancy plate then chainmail under. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I like how on page five, this one, I like how... I'll try to channel some of this, where there's like a fade on her outfit that goes from like pink to green. But then I went back in and used this uh, darker pink or fuchsia color for the detailing of like the scale mail or the fabric folds or whatever and the straps. And I feel like that is a nice look where the color, the dark color that's at the top of the gradient continues as like the accent color all the way into the greens. I think I'm gonna try to do the same thing over here. But I want, this one needs more like Again, this is going to be wild. This is like a really tricky thing because I really want there to be like reflections and, and light bouncing off of it. And I want some of that light to come from the environment. So whatever colors I'm using in the background, I'm going to try to weave into the armor. It's going to be intense. Yeah, I'm not actually, everybody's, I mean, I'm an okay, I've said this before, but I'm like an okay artist. Oh, I don't know, Lydia, did I tell you I found a, uh, I have it, I have it in the other room, I should get it at some point and show it. I have, uh, there was like one time in high school I asked, I was trying to practice inking, I was trying to practice my like brush and dip pen inking, and uh, I asked Lydia to draw like just, just pencil something that I could ink, and I still have it. So like one of the only times that I ever inked Lydia's pencils was in high school and I, I have it in the other room. I found it when I was visiting my mom. She had like she had it in just like a box of old art stuff. But I never got really super good at like the line art part of comics. I just never it was just never my strength. I can I can draw okay, but I'm really slow.
Okay, so the, tr the, the thing that's starting to work here that should be the entire goal of this entire page is this green crosses two very distinct color blocks, right? So this her green hair crosses between this orangey magenta panel on the right and it, it continues on and crosses over onto this like blue purple panel on the left. And the, this green pops really well against both of those colors. So theoretically, if, the, if everything on this page works that way, where every color, there's a lot of color variation, but every color pops from every other color, then we win. And that's like what's so hard about this sequence. Because no, no one is, uh, is simple. Everybody on this page, every character, every object on this page is gonna have a bunch of colors on it and is gonna be crossing over a lot of different backgrounds. So we have to figure out how to get that kind of like, pop. it's also working pretty well here where like the the gradient from on this ski, water skiing pyramid from purple to blue helps it pop as it goes from like light blue to orange to red. And then same thing, the, the green gradient on the parrotfish pops against all the way down as the gradient behind it goes from like red to orange to blue. So that's why this is so hard is because everything has to be like really expressive and fun, but you can't make the wrong choice or all of a sudden it's gonna like get really muddy or like get hard to see. So that's what I'm trying to like keep in mind. And that's why it's really hard to do this live because you're gonna watch me like, there's gonna be times where I'm gonna like struggle and just kind of be flipping through color options and blending modes trying to get stuff to like work. The skull should be this pink color. That's what I did last time, right? Okay, yeah. The last time I did the skull fading from like a mint green to a pink. So we'll and wait, what color did I do the antlers? Because we have to do those. So the ant and the antlers faded from dark pink to green. So we can try to do that again. Just replicate that again. Yeah, I don't know. Writing, writing. <laughs> By the way, your name is incredible, Pickle Juice McJaberson. <laughs> Um, I gotta be honest with you, writing is like the one thing that I have not figured out how to make like super good videos on. Uh, writing is a very like cerebral kind of like, it's very like technical art form and it's really hard to make videos that aren't like overly technical or just, I don't know, I've never gotten the views to work like they, they, people just don't watch them all the way through and the algorithm doesn't really push them and the to be honest like a lot of writing the discipline of writing comics is actually just the discipline of writing like if you study screenwriting or novels it, it, it's pretty much a lot of the same it's one of the only parts of comics that i think really crosses over um like for example if you study painting that doesn't necessarily like landscape painting that doesn't necessarily mean you're going to be a great comic book artist you know what i mean because so much of comic books is not drawing one thing perfectly it's about like understanding how to tell a story with multiple drawings but writing does sort of translate because it's about like act breaks and character development and pacing your story and writing good dialogue like you can be a screenwriter and write comics because you kind of understand pacing and how to write dialogue so it's all to say I haven't really made a lot of writing videos because there's a whole wing of the internet where you can learn about the theory and craft of writing. And it might be through the context of novels or screenwriting. And you can watch those influencers or creators and like learn a bunch that will translate. So I, I don't know. It, it feels almost like it's its own world that I haven't really cracked. And that other people almost do a better job of it than we do. 
Um, I, don't, I just haven't found the angle. Maybe that's a maybe that's something to try to explore in a longer form YouTube video. That's not a because it's really hard to do in a short, obviously. But I haven't found the angle that makes like a, that that brings something new to the table on writing as like as a video that people will be interested in. Every time I've tried to talk about writing, people are just like, okay, this is boring. And you look at the retention numbers and it's like, no one finishes the video and the algorithm doesn't know what to do with it. So something to figure out, I guess. <laughs> damn, damn, I, I discovered you through shorts. It's really working out, man. Thank you. Yeah, I guess what's cool about the lives that I do really like is that so like whenever I make a short about coloring, there's so many people who are like, "Well, this is wrong because you say that you wanted to express this, but that's wrong or like that's not how I would do it." And uh and I'm like, "Man, if I had another 4 minutes, I could explain to you like all the other context decisions that led to like that color choice or that emotion that I'm trying to convey." And one of the nice things about the lives is that you can actually like talk through process. My favorite ones are when I'm like showing a, a, a page that takes place like in this kind of sequence because our comic jumps back and forth between like dreams and reality. <laughs> and I'll show a page that's like this, right? That's like an absolute like I mean, it's so different than our other work because it's supposed to be this like absolute like mind trip, like psychedelic dream sequence. <laughs> People in the comments will be like, too many colors, bro. It's really busy. I'm like, yeah, it, you're supposed to be uncomfortable when you read it. Like people will write like, uh, this hurts my eyes. Like I, I don't like this. And I'm like, that's, that's like, that's like watching nothing but Disney movies and then watching a horror movie and being like, why am I scared? <laughs> I don't want to feel scared. And it's like, well, that's the emotion that we're trying to, as creators, like convey onto you. And so it's like nice to go on live and like be able to like explain through our process and like the context in a little bit more detail, you know? Also, it's always the people who have, you know, absolutely no art posted who have the strongest. I've, that part, if, if anybody who's young is watching and you're like concerned about the reaction that your art gets online, I can tell you right now that it's always people who don't have any art posted who are gonna come after you. So that should make you feel better about like getting up the courage to share your own work. Um, anyone who's actually doing anything creative and like contributing anything creative to the world has done enough to be a little bit humbled. They won't come in hot, you know what I mean? that's important to remember is that like any comments that you're getting on your stuff that are like less than favorable it's all projection from people who are like insecure who who haven't done anything themselves and don't know what they're talking about so that's just always i talk a lot about about that but i just want to constantly remind especially young people that <laughs> i have yet to get a constructive well thought out comment uh, from someone who has no art posted on their own channel. That's never happened. Oh, it's Myosotis. Have you, Myosotis, have you been in every live? I feel like you're the only one, maybe one of the only ones who's like managed to come to every single one, which is impressive because we have no like consistent schedule. Okay, wait, if Lydia's still here, oh yeah, there you are. Um, Lydia, do you think that the tome sh should, should have a consistent, because we see it in multiple different dream sequences, should the tome have a consistent color? Like, should it always appear? Because you know how the spirit, like, she, even though the colors of the worlds change, she always appears as like pink and green. 
should the tome because it's like this MacGuffin object should it like have its own color scheme or should it like mm, it's pretty visually distinct right it's always this it's obviously the same thing narratively you always have it glowing Yeah, see, this is where it, like, this is where it gets really interesting because uh, Lydia and I are such a, like, we're, there's two people making this story, so we can think through some of these decisions in a more sophisticated way, right? So in the story, the MacGuffin of the story is this, I'm trying not to spoil it, is this book, this tome. Um, it appears across multiple dream sequences. It's actually here. It's this glowing book in on this page, right? And so the I, from a narrative standpoint, there may be a reason to make the tome consistent because it's always the same object she's chasing across every dream, even though the dreams change. But it also represents, the tome is actually a sophisticated object that represents different parts of her personality. So it could change. It could represent different goals in her life too. The gem, oh, the gem. Like, is the gem consistent? <laughs> All right, we'll, we'll think about it. I feel like maybe making it always have like a yellowy orange glow is like kind of smart. But I don't, I have to think about it. It's also gonna make it harder sometimes to color it because it, it will have to always pop even though it's always consistent. I feel like I feel like one thing that that I really like about how we work is that because there's a, because we do everything we can think through these kinds of decisions in like a much more sophisticated way. I think like in filmmaking we've kind of collectively we kind of collectively understand um the importance of like having an auteur. You know, like you have a somebody who understands all all parts of the filmmaking process like a director has to have an opinion about sound design and props and set design and like films tend to be better when one or two people like uh the daniels right who did everything everywhere all at once like they that was the, that movie is good because it's the result of a very focused small number of creative people touching every aspect of the process right i think I think one of the reasons why manga has kind of become so popular is that it tends to be, it tends to reward auteurs a little bit more. American comics have, in a lot of mainstream American comics, and I know there's exceptions, have kind of like turned into like production factories where like different people do different parts of the process. And it's other than, there, there's exceptions. I was referencing James Stokoe. I'm pretty sure he does everything. But I, one of the reasons that I like how Lydia and I work is we've, we're kind of like showing the importance of like having that auteur mindset that like coloring done by the writer is going to have really interesting decisions that benefit the narrative and the story that like enhance little nuances of the story because I actually understand some of what we're trying to do um, overall. And, and or even things like Lydia doing the... Um, the sound effects by hand uh, instead of letting a separate letter who wasn't involved in the art do it you know what I mean like it just there's just more nuance to it that that makes it a more immersive story um, I think that manga in general tends to have you know somebody at the top kind of like guiding it with a little bit more of like a focused eye and I think that's one of the reasons why people are really seem to be responding to those stories more and more as time goes on. Wait, how do you say, how do you say your name? Fluck, hang on, Fluxlexi? My dumb little, don't call your comic dumb. My, my comic will be called Graffiti Grades and is based on some weird alien guys who are in high school. It is set in New York City. That's pretty cool. Graffiti Grades is like a sick name for a... It's like a sick name for a comic. It sounds like a hip-hop collective. 
It's got like Wu Tang graffiti grades. Is like a cool. Sounds like a cool mixtape or something. All right, so you can see how I'm using. Um, I'm just using a default round brush, and I'm. I think a lot of people always ask about brushes. There are things like hair brushes for making hair that come with like predetermined kind of like patterns or shapes that do strands. Um, I tend to like the control of just doing everything by hand. So you can see from a distance that there's something really nice and sort of like um, organic about her hair, but it's all done with a default round brush just sitting here and painting in the strands trying to follow Lydia's line art. So you can do everything you need to do with default brushes. Um, and personally, I think I can always tell if somebody kind of cheated and used a uh, used too much texture. Um, I think you see it especially on things like leaves and hair where people try to kind of just like click and scatter it and just like get repeating patterns. And I think I can always tell. So I'm not going to knock somebody for trying to save time, but I do, I do encourage people to take the time to paint it in by hand because you can get like a lot more elegant effects with it, I think, in my opinion. What's a good what's a good exercise to practice color theory? Um well, I've made a video about it before. It's the double double complements where you pull up a you pull up the color wheel and you grab you pick a set of complements. So, for example, like yellow and purple, right? And you give yourself Actually, this page this page is double complements. So you you pull up the color wheel, you pull you pick a set of complements, so yellow and purple, and then you pick two variations of yellow and purple. So you do like light yellow and like light purple, slightly darker purple, slightly darker yellowy orange, and then you just use those four colors. It's called double complements. I made a video about it. It's in our like coloring playlist um, on YouTube. And you can like, if you just pick pairs within a complement family, you start to understand like how limiting your choices like forces you to make different decisions. So there you go. I use, I've made the video about double complements. It has like a million views, but it's not just, I didn't just make it up for the video. You know what I mean? Like I actually use it all the time on pages. But yeah, look up uh, compl like look up complementary colors and look up like secondary colors, and look at look at the color wheel and you'll start to figure out like um, pick pick pairs of things that are uh, opposite from each other on the color wheel and force yourself to only use that. So like this is like secondary colors, uh, purple and green, right? Like use use pairs of purples and greens together like I'm doing here and only use those and you start to figure out like which ones pop from each other what still gives you like a nice um, kind of feeling of contrast and differentiation basically the way to practice color theory is to force yourself to only to do exercises where you only use a very limited number of colors and then you actually will figure out some really interesting like it, it retrains your brain because then you you're you're if you force yourself to use a limited palette, you're not allowed to make things literal. Like if you only have green and purple, you can't paint someone um, wearing a blue shirt. So you have to, even if you're working from a photo reference where they're wearing a blue shirt, you have to translate that into what's like an equivalent color that will give me the uh, that same tone that I'm going for. If that makes sense.
Okay, so now I'm just painting. I do this all the time where I I paint over the lines in very select places just to give uh, some slight variation. So you can see I, I'm making all the lines in this panel purple, but not these like little starbursts. Shout out Starburst, sponsor us. But sometimes I just use like a color hold to just knock some of the lines back and it adds more like dimension and depth to the panel. Unfortunately, it means you also have to go in here and like paint it all out by hand and you have to avoid putting, putting this purple color on lines that you don't want to be purple so you can see like I don't want to this is the this these lines right here are the antlers coming off of her skull on her head I don't want those to be purple so the only way to really do this is to go in and paint by hand all the lines behind it so that there's like a consistency to it to to what has a purple line on it and what doesn't and then when I zoom out you can see that all the lines that I made purple I kind of start to sit back and let the character pop forward, which is really nice. Oh yeah, Scott, shout out Scott McLeod. Look at what I have right behind me. I've got uh, the book that everybody who wants to make comics should, I genuinely, I, this is, this is not a, a joke. Like I actually keep this book after making comics for like 20 years. I still keep uh, understanding comics by Scott McCloud, like within reach. I don't just do this so I can show it on stream. I actually like reference this book like regularly. Um, he like shows you. He like shows you all kinds of like really weird, interesting techniques that like help you, like understand pacing and like how to communicate certain things to your reader. So yeah, I use that all the time. People think it's like a meme that like I'm always talking about that book or something and I'm like, no, I actually still use it. I think when that book was published in the 90s, he got quotes for the back of the book from like very famous comic artists and the quotes were like, I didn't know that. <laughs> it's like, I didn't know that, John Byrne. I learned something reading this book, Stan Lee. Like it's a, it's an absolutely like essential foundational book that like everybody should have. Yeah. Didn't the guy, I mean, that's the other thing too, is like, I really, Lydia's point about like Scott McCloud's book is not actually, it's made by a Western artist, but it's not, it actually feels kind of like the art style that he chose for it is very cartoony, so it actually feels like like an interesting nexus point between like manga and American comics. So if you're if you think that you won't learn it because you're trying to only learn manga, first of all, it's all just comics, and second of all, uh, Scott McCloud stuff is like super good for no matter what style you're doing. Yeah, this one, the, you can see the French comic influences. Yeah, this one's like super, I feel like this one is very, uh, this spread in particular really reminds me of like, yeah, the Incal or something. Like It's very like playful in like a Mobius way. All right, let's do some stuff in this panel just so we can figure out like what we're doing. I, th oh man, I don't know what to do. It would be pretty interesting to flat every object in this panel here. And then, and then put a gradient across it all. It'd be pretty gangster. We might, let's try it. All right, let's try it. I'm going to sample a color that I've already used just for consistency. So we'll do 
like this orange. Sorry, I'm just organizing my layers. So this is one, two, three, panel four. Panel four elements. Okay, yeah. It's confusing because normally I group everything by panel, like so that like you can see, I don't hopefully you can see this. I know it's small on the screen, but there's a folder called big panel that's everything inside the water skiing parrotfish panel. So if I turn it on and off, you can see like pretty much, I'm just trying to group together layers, layers just to keep myself from getting confused. Everything that's in this big panel, right? Um, the problem is that in order to get a consistent gradient across these two panels, panels I guess three and four, although this little insert is probably considered a panel of her face. But to get a consistent gradient across three and four, I just flatted them together and then put a gradient across the whole thing. So now it's a little confusing because I can't like group them exactly by like panel three group panel four. Um, so I'm just trying to get organized here and like figure out what the hell I've done because I, I work really fast and I forget like to label my stuff. Let's see, pirate ship. Oh, nice, yeah. In industrial arts and crafts, I'm assuming you do like, do you do like 3D printing or like metal work? Like, is it like industrial art in that way? I already don't like this color I chose. Okay. It's too, it's not, this color doesn't like pop enough from the, the orangey background. So let's sample something over here. I also hate this. <laughs> okay, I'll just finish flatting it and then we'll try some color choices. Everybody look at the bunny on the keel of the ship. That's cute. The ship has a bunny instead of like a mermaid lady. Or it's a real bunny being, I thought it was carved, but it could be a, a real bunny being keel hauled, <laughs> which would be dark. Haunted houses and escape rooms. Oh, cool. So it's like it's like set builds and full scale, like, yeah, like it's got to be like lighting, sculpture, set design, production design, interior design, all that stuff. Fabrication. That's cool. Declan Shelby. Oh yeah, Declan Shelby. I feel like I was really into Declan Shelby's art in high school. Oh man, Lydia, you drew the sails so accurately. They're all like layered. I have to like make sure that I like get them correct. <laughs> this is like such a good drawing of a ship. It's like so detailed.
gonna go pretty red on that just to get it to pop. I might really tweak the colors of things later. It took me a really long time to get the colors of this like water skiing pyramid down. Like I was just, at first it started with them all just being blue. And then I was like playing with slight variations until I landed on this like purple because I really didn't look when when the, so the bottom of these pirates down here I like it when they're this like light purple because when I didn't have it I really didn't I don't know I just there's it felt like kind of like weird to have her be this like reddish purple color right against this dark blue color I just felt like it was a weird I don't know I don't know why I don't like it it, it feels like two default colors or something instead of like there being any kind of nuance so once i put this purple fade on it sort of felt like you know what it, you know what it was when when you don't have this purple fade on and she's purple holding on to somebody who's blue it like kind of damages the sense that she's stuck on to him you know what i mean like it's too differentiated but when they're similar there's a sense that they're like merged together like she's clinging on for dear life and he's he's a separate object but they're they're really married together if that makes sense so it took me a while to even get that down and i just realized i forgot to color her hand here which is important The blocks, the blocks are also an opportunity to uh, create some visual parallelism. Like I like how the the top panel here is yellow, predominantly yellow background, and then there's this block down here on the bottom right is also yellow. So you get kind of like this nice balance. And we might want to actually, again, this is a spread. Like it's pretty likely these two appear together. I don't know how this is paginated, but I would assume that we're gonna to try to get something like this to work as a spread versus you turn the page and see one of them. So so I may wanna actually think about like not just balancing on one page, but actually like putting a yellow and orange block here or something, you know? So the last time I colored her hair, this green hair, it did this like cool, so the color of her earrings is this like kind of like electric, like I don't know, we'll call it like Gatorade green. <laughs> and, uh, and then I put the fade and then her eyes are this like bright electric green and then her hair fades into it, which is super cool. So I'll put that on her hair here. And then, and you'll see, that'll actually create balance with the, with some more parts of the pages too. Yeah, that's cool. So I'm gonna keep pushing parts of this bottom right panel to have that like lem uh, lemony electric Gatorade green, which will start to come into play up here in the top left too. so that everything has like a diagonal balance. So that, except let me put them in the right order because they actually appear like this. This is actually how this spread comes together. 
yeah that's cool so the the bottom left has this like bright bright green and then we can start to bring it in in the top right and then top left sort of magenta orange we'll keep pushing it on the bottom right here but tr thinking of diagonal balance is like a really that's like a life hack for like finding compositional balance in your art yeah i mean i've tried i've tried streaming on twitch but i mean twitch i will say twitch is really good but uh we have 230 whatever th i don't know it says at the bottom 237,000 followers here on youtube and like no followers really we haven't spent the time to build up followers on twitch and it is nice to like press live and everybody gets a notification here on youtube you know what i mean or it's to show up in people's recommended page the live so we could do twitch but it's you have to like start over and build up an audience there too you know it's like nice that the audience has built in from the followers that we've gotten from shorts i watch a lot of twitch streamers though i have uh an account that I will never reveal so that I can remain anonymous in the Twitch chat. Yeah, so again, I'm just thinking about like balance. I feel like whatever I, d it's interesting because what's happening is I didn't mean to do this, but both pirate ship panels are kind of the same color scheme right now, which means that you could actually create like some visual consistency where the, whatever color the pirate ship appears at, appears as here, it can also be that color here. So you're never, I mean, it, it's, it's not really like you're going to get confused because it's, there's only, there's only one pirate ship on, you know, in this story, but it'll be very clear that that's the same ship from a different angle, you know what I mean? Yeah, that's cool. So she's also got these like really cool earrings um, that last time I colored them to be this like electric green as well. I might have to watch the, uh, I might have to push them further this time though. Maybe they'll get a little bit more yellow just so they pop. Because I really like the, the fade. This is the same color that's the like electric green fade on, on her hair. But that fade is starting to cross over up here and make these earrings not pop as much. So maybe we'll actually take this uh, earring and push it even further just so it pops. Because I don't really want to change the fade over here on the left. Like I like how the distance that it covers, you know? Oh, but there is shading. Well, we, we can shade her hair. There's shading uh, like where her hair kind of like... Lydia did a really nice jo job of rendering her hair so that there's like a... Uh, like an edge here where sort of you're seeing the depth of it. This is sort of like the beginning of the underside of her hair. So we'll put some shadowing in there and that'll help these like green earrings pop off of the green hair because we'll, we'll push the color darker behind it. Hopefully that makes sense. It's hard to explain this stuff, but hopefully that makes sense. I'm assuming her, we'll make her chain green for now too. Oh, and there's a little bit of hair over here that I missed. Let me get that.
just like the little strands that go behind her head here. Cool, I really like where this is going. It's starting to really work. Let's do, before I get too in the weeds on these two panels, let's like finish out the the blocks and stuff just so we understand like the composition of the page overall. I'll just, for now, I'll just steal the same. I'll just steal the same yellow that I was using over here. I'm just gonna make a layer called blocks just for now. And just rough this in. Again, the danger, I talk about this a lot, but the danger with uh, getting too excited about one part of a panel is you forget to develop the, the page as a whole and seeing, leaving these blank is not necessarily a great idea. Uh, because I'm going to want to know how these colors and shapes affect the page composition, and that might change the choices that I have um, inside the panels, right? So it's good to develop the page like as a whole so that you can make, like, you want a macro view of your page. Oh, that's not going to work. Yeah, yellow is not going to work at all because it won't make her hair pop. But that's a good example, right? I got so excited, like, I got so excited about painting her hair in and all this stuff that my and I, it just in my head I was always like oh yeah I'll make these all these blocks on the page I'll make them yellow I got so in the weeds on like developing this last panel that I kind of have to change my plan because I don't want to now change the hair I like that the hair is green but I can't put a I can't put a yellow gradient behind it like it doesn't it, it just muddies it up right so I have to pick a different color for that so this block has to pop from the green it has to be, it's right behind this panel, which is like pink, so it can't be pink. There's purple in front of it from the antlers. So I gotta find something that, mm, that works. It might just have to be light blue for now. Let me look through my palette. Oh, but it can't be too light. It can't be too light because that hair has got to pop. Hang on. How does this work? Oh, that might be okay. We're gonna, we'll have to push it a little bit, but it, it's going to have to go a little bit darker to to get the hair to pop. But it'll work. This this panel or this block on the left here can be yellow. If you don't mind, talk about your rollout process as well as your marketing for new issues. Especially your first issue. Oh, like how we how we like rolled that out from like a getting the word out standpoint. Um our rollout product, like from a, that's more of like a business and marketing question, right? Like how did we, we have issue one, how do we like roll it out? How do we get the word out? Uh, I'm trying to think of how to answer that in a way that's not me just saying like, we made it up as we went, but we kind of did. We kind of just, well, okay, well, I'll tell you this. If you, so you're, um, give me, I, I exist. Give me, a, give me more context. Are you asking because you're trying to release your very first comic and you want to know kind of how to market it? Is that, because I can answer, I can answer that question for sure. Um, based on the, because we, we didn't have a strategy that was super concrete for issue one. And I feel like we kind of had to like figure it out as we went. And now that we've done it, um, we definitely have some insight. Are you looking to use like predominantly social media to get the word out? Are you looking, are you printing it? Are you, is it digital? Like, how are you releasing it? Cause that would also affect how you like talk about it and market it and roll it out. 
are you gonna you are you gonna go to comic conventions? Are you gonna sell through your own website? Are you gonna try to sell through like a storefront on an existing site like Amazon or something? What is your opinion on D and D? Uh, terrible. I hate having fun. I hate. <laughs> I hate uh, sitting with all of my best friends in a room all day eating delicious snacks, talking in weird voices, <laughs> escaping the miserable, miserable drudgery of my life by pretending to be somebody else. No, I love D&D. D&D is the best, man. Um, I played a lot of D&D in high school and some in college it was very uh, foundational to my taste like uh, all of my interest in like fantasy and science fiction and storytelling I think started a lot with D&D I wish there was a I wish I could find like a like I love d and I love D&D but I also think it's fun to play other types of role-playing games um, just because it changes like D&D is such a specific vibe like such a specific rule set and world um, I would really like to find like a really cool role-playing game that's more in like the Conan type of like more like classic Robert E. Howard sword and sorcery so like less um, I don't know. I don't. I'm trying to decide. I'm trying to figure out. Like, like D and D in general is a little bit more like Lord of the Ringsy, and like it'd be fun to find like a setting and a rule set that was like, that was like a little bit more like Conan. Conan is a little bit. There's a little bit less like overt magic and a little bit more like going into towns and f like murdering people. <laughs> I don't advocate for that IRL, obviously. I mean, there's got to be like a Conan the Barbarian role-playing game, right? But there's no way it's famous if I, as a Conan fan, don't like know it off the bat, right? I don't know. It's hard to explain. If you've consumed both D&D, &D, or if you've consumed Lord of the Rings, like D&D, &D, and then you've also read the original Robert E. Howard Conan stories, like there's a, there's a vibe. There's a different vibe to them, and it's very hard to explain. But like Robert E. Howard and J.R.R. Tolkien were working in complete, I, I don't think they knew that the other one existed, right? Like they, they created their worlds with entirely different goals. Like J.R.R. Tolkien created Lord of the Rings as like an out, outlet for his languages that he was designing. And Robert E. Howard has said that he was obsessed with history and he was trying to pay the bills by writing pulp stories, but he really just wanted to write like historical essays. So he was like hiding real world history references all over his stories. So they have a very different vibe. Like Robert E. Howard feels like more like a historical, like somebody playing with uh, tropes from actual history. And J.R.R. Tolkien feels more like fantastical and mystical and like a lot more uh, mythology behind it versus just someone stumbling into like an allegory for like, you know, India and experiencing like uh, culture culture that we sort of vaguely feels familiar there has to be a Conan RPG right I wonder if it's kind of boring because it's like oh roll up a character oh you're a fighter <laughs> is, that what the, is that what the Conan RPG is is it just like everybody is a barbarian <laughs> There's kind of, well, maybe you can be like a sorcerer, right? Or like a trickster or something. But there's only really like four types of Conan stories. It's like Conan the pirate, Conan the, the king, the like warrior king, Conan the, I walked into a tavern and accidentally overheard about a treasure outside of town kind of story. <laughs> I don't know. I wonder if, I wonder if it would just get stale. I don't know. Adventures, oh, that's a good name. Adventures in an Age Undreamed of. 
All right, I'll check that out. I'm a massive Conan fan. Uh, particularly the original, original Robert E. Howard stories and the 70s Marvel Savage Sword stuff. I mean, Pirate Conan, come on, that's like this sequence right here. Okay, I really like, as I was sort of rambling about Conan, I was kind of exploring what it looks like if all of these like tentacle tendrils that Lydia, um, that Lydia drew, I was exploring what they look like if they're green and I really like it. I think it like adds to the sense of balance on the page where they sort of reference the, the green in this spirit character. have Gatorade. Yeah, there's a lot of Gatorade on this page. I like to think of my color palettes actually entirely through Gatorade flavors, right? So we've got original lime. We've got grape, right? We've got uh, watermelon because there's, there's a, uh, I know there's a watermelon Gatorade. And uh, we've got the blue no one actually knows what color that is. I mean, what flavor that is. No one knows what flavor blue is. I can't tell you. I just call it blue. And then there's like Gatorade orange down here. It's a Gatorade. Yeah, here's, here's Gatorade orange down here. It's an entirely Gatorade-based color palette. Shout out Gatorade. We are available for sponsorships. What other, are there other blue Gatorades besides blue? Oh, Glacier, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. That's, well, there's two, there's the, this is like the light blue Gatorade and this is like the dark blue. They're right next to each other. I'm such an athlete. <laughs> I drink so much Gatorade, you guys. I'm such an athlete. It makes me fit. It makes me, <laughs> When I when I walk up the stairs, I when I manage to stumble outside of my apartment after coloring comics for hours and hours, and I walk up the stairs, my heart rate elevates and I sweat and it comes out Gatorade colored, which means I'm healthy. Like those commercials. There's something going on. So you can see here, I don't know where this came from, but there's like, I accidentally have some layer stacking where the half tone from something else is like bleeding over here onto this uh, square here, which, which I actually like, oh, it's from this. It's from whatever this is, um, which I actually like. Like I kind of embrace those kinds of random things that happen. It just adds to a sense of like uh, unpredictability that feels a little bit less digital and a little bit more like the hand of the hand of an artist touched it. You know what I mean? Like if you look at old old comic covers that were actually airbrushed, there's like a little bit of like splatter and bleed from the airbrush that they didn't quite like mask off, and it's just like these kinds of happy I guess Bob Ross calls them happy accidents this little like I don't know where that came from it's just like a leftover layer but it just adds something you know what I mean so I try not to just like get too rigid and erase that stuff now I like that new video idea make a comic only using Gatorade that's a solid like, you know how, like, Liquid Death, like, 
Liquid Death is always like getting a lot of like press because they do like r weird cool marketing stunts or they release like weird merch or whatever. I feel like if Gatorade should do it would crush like Gatorade should do should release like a palette of watercolors that are all like Gatorade colors and then they should have like an art challenge where a bunch of like streamers and influencers like in the art space like use use the they send them like you know they make like a hundred palettes they send them out to a hundred influencers and then they have an art contest to see like what the best Gatorade art they can make is using like electric blue and lime green and orange orange free marketing idea for the Gatorade people. There you go. That's a, uh, that's a sick idea. Cause then you got like a bunch of people making content for you and like talking about your product. And like you have all the influencers would do the unboxing video when they first got the like paint palette. And then they, they would do the content where they like show themselves actually using it to do the art. And then you would do the like award show where you give away the prize, whatever the prize is, to the best art. Do like a live stream where you like give away the awards. The Gatorade people just left the chat. Yeah, it was actually, it was actually, the person who said that was actually just a Gatorade employee who's like talking to ChatGPT without a lot of success. Like, ChatGPT, help. I need Gatorade marketing ideas. ChatGPT is like not helping them. So they like came in here and they were like, <laughs> hey, any funny ideas? And I just like gave them a sick marketing idea. Um, no, who who said that about the Gatorade? Wiley, Wiley. that's a solid idea, man. I've, I, Wiley, I think I've seen you in here before. It's and uh, I'm not actually accusing you of being an undercover Gatorade employee. <laughs> um, somebody asked, "Hello, first time in the live. What's your what's your s comic about?" It's a uh, well, okay, so yeah, John Gatorade was here. John Gatorade was like, I'm going to go where the youths are. We need to get that Gen Z marketing steez. I hear it's all about the Riz. Hello, my name is John Gatorade. And uh, I hear that the youth are into Riz. And I'm going to go into a youth space on a stream to find out how to get Riz into our ads. I, um, seriously, shout out Gatorade, sponsor us. Use our, I'll, we'll do a partnership. We'll do like one of those things where, you know, like influencers are always like partnering with companies and doing like their own additions. We'll do like a bad ink Gatorade color palette and then we'll use the Gatorade color palette to make like a, a comic page or something. I'm telling you, that's like gotta be a good marketing idea. Okay, so for the person, yeah, the person who asked about what our comic is about, every every issue is a different story. So it's like if you've seen Twilight Zone, like if you ever, like me, ever turned on like Sci-Fi Channel growing up over like, thanks, I think it was like Thanksgiving weekend or something and they had like a Twilight Zone marathon. It's that vibe of like every every issue is a different story. So you don't have to, it's not one story where you like, uh, have to know what was going on for like 900 issues. It's not One Piece, even though like shout out One Piece. One Piece is cool. You don't have to have 900 like issues under your belt to know what's going on. It's just like pick up and read. And they're all like designed to be like self-contained sci-fi fantasy stories. And they're all very like, yeah, like Twilight Zone-y. There's like ironic twists and kind of like speculative near future concepts and it's very like inf influenced by like uh, classic sci-fi, classic comics. You know, if you are familiar with old school Judge Dredd or Heavy Metal Magazine, Twilight Zone, I guess Black Mirror um, would be a modern equivalent.
one thing that I think is a totally lost art is, um, yeah, like anthology storytelling. I think, I think most people who watch us are manga fans or anime fans, and it like absolutely like breaks people's brain that something wouldn't be <laughs> nine hundred issues long. You know what I mean? Like, I think that uh, manga and anime do a really good job of like ongoing storytelling, but. I think there's a lost art in in all comics from both America and Japan, or the I should say the Western world, and Japan. The art of like the short story. I think like the self-contained, and I don't just mean like a one-off where you take the characters from something and tell a self-contained story. I mean like because those are already characters that you know from something else that are already developed. I think there's a real lost art to like the short story where everything has to be done, character development, story like act breaks has to be done in like 40 pages like i think that's like a lot i think there's like just like using a limited color palette forces you to make like interesting choices like i think limiting your pages that you have to work with is, is like a really interesting way to tell um your story yeah ha halloween 3 no one knows that season is that season of the witch Halloween 3 is, I think, totally underrated. Halloween 3 is uh, one of my favorites of that franchise. And it's like, yeah, Season of the Witch. It like broke, that also broke people's brains when it came out because everybody was used to the slasher movies that have like 19 parts. And Halloween 3 was just like randomly like a bunch of short stories. Um, and I think in modern times, it's kind of, there's kind of been some justice for it. Like I think... For those of you who don't know, the movie Halloween 3 was like totally considered like a failure. But I think modern, like there's some modern reevaluation of that film is like very brave and actually surprisingly good. I don't know if it's like perfect, but I really like it. Also the Twilight Zone movie from around the same era it was like mid mid 80s the twilight zone movie is cool it's like three they basically took three episodes of the twilight zone and uh retold them but they still kept them short story like self-contained short stories creep creep show the 80s had like some cool anthology storytelling again i think it's kind of a lost art like it's not done as much everything now has to be like a season of a TV show has to actually be like 12 episodes that are one long story, you know? Even American Horror Story, which is technically anthology, is actually like long, season-long stories. Like, I, I kind of, other than Black Mirror, I can't think of any like high production value, true anthology storytelling, you know what I mean? Uh, St Star Trek Strange New Worlds kind of brought that back. There's like ongoing story arcs, but they do have like individual stories, which is really fun every every episode. Yeah, Tales from the Crypt. The 80s had it had it going on, man. The more I think about it, the more a lot of that stuff was I mean, the 80s was kind of people in the 80s were actually remixing a lot of stuff from the 50s, right? Like a lot of what I'm referencing are actually like Tales from the Crypt, Creep Show, um, Twilight Zone, the Twilight Zone movie. Like all that stuff in the 80s was actually people. It was boomers remixing their childhood, right? It was like all these guys who had grown up with comics in the 50s, 30 years later, like redoing them. So the the 50s and the 80s were like real golden ages of anthology storytelling. Oh yeah, trick or treat. I feel like I feel like I've seen that. The wreck or no. There's a horror movie series called VHS, right? That's like three I think each each movie is like three short stories that have like a found footage vibe. I love all that stuff. Anyway, we're kind of bringing some of that back to comics with the self-contained very intentionally distinct stories each time, you know? All right, so this is definitely working. You can see how the color story is still similar, but it's starting to get a little bit more sophisticated where I'm trying to keep these blocks um, 
yellow and orange so that there's like a consistent kind of scattering of those colors to kind of unite the page. And then this one over here, we can start trying to figure out how to create that same balance. But wait, let me turn off the, let me turn off the windows. These will go, eventually they'll go together really nicely. And when we're coloring in stuff like her head uh, here, or her hand here, or this, so there's a parrotfish and there's also a catfish. Um, but when we color in that stuff, we can start to like match some of the color. Like I'm sh pretty sure it would make sense for this catfish to be green also so that there's like a parallelism to the parrot, you know what I mean? Um, well, that's very kind of you, Harley, but the we don't sell our stuff in comic stores, um, but we sell through our own website, and once I'm done coloring this issue, we'll print it, it'll be up in our web store, and there's gonna be a ton of merch that you can buy. So, we are, we're not in comic stores, and that's because it's actually like quite, the distribution system into comic stores is actually tricky. It's a very, it's more complicated, I think, maybe than people realize. And we kind of took a look at the landscape and realized that it actually made a lot of sense for us to just control our distribution by selling through our own web store. Um, so... Yeah, that's a whole other topic. But I appreciate it. And uh, you can definitely pick it up when, when we print it and put it in our store. Oh, yeah. Well, of course. Yeah, Love, Death, and Robots. I heard, I heard a rumor that Love, Death, and Robots actually started as an attempt to reboot Heavy Metal. Um, and it eventually became Love, Death, and Robots because they didn't actually get the rights to Heavy Metal or something. But I, that's what I, I heard. It started as an attempt to reboot Heavy Metal, the Heavy Metal Heavy Metal movie, um, which is which makes a lot of sense when you watch it and you know that it actually makes a lot of sense because it's got the same vibe as early Heavy Metal. Okay, just because I'm bored of flatting, I'm really, I really should flat out these pages and like work with discipline and actually flat things completely and then start like going in with detailing but i just get so goddamn bored of flatting so i think i'm just gonna shade some stuff because i'm bored and i want to like keep myself like my brain active like i want to not just want to die and if you flat too much <laughs> you just want to die um, so I might just switch to shading just because it's more fun. Uh, ooh, you know what we should show? Lydia, I don't know if you're still here, but I kind of want to show. So Lydia has been drawing the most ridiculous pages you've ever seen for this issue. Like the most detail, like the only reason that we're able to do art at this level is because we don't have a deadline. Like we can control our own time. Um, and so Lydia, some of the later, the, some of the last pages in this issue are so crazy. And uh, I had to ask Lydia for help, or rather Lydia volunteered to help flat some of them because they're so crazy. I kind of want to show one of them just as like a like flash it on the screen just so people can see like what it looks like when you actually flat something that complicated. Should I do that? It's sort of a, it's not a spoiler because it's like, what the hell is even going on and just like it's just a it's just for the live right it's just a treat uh i don't know should i show it it's so sick all right i'll show it just for a second but i want everybody to see what it looks like when you when you take the time to flat like something this complicated did it go I'm air dropping it to myself yeah here we go check this out just a quick yeah it's so cool man 
um, it's like a Where's Waldo page. So uh, Lydia actually volunteered to help flat because it's so complicated that I actually sometimes don't know exactly where objects start and end because it's it's so complicated. Like there's so much detail. So um, it's really helpful to actually have the artist flat it so they can tell you exactly like where everything is. Um, and none of the colors are are like exactly what they're going to end up being. It's like Lydia flatted it specifically with the intent that the colors stand out from each other. Just just trying to prioritize like contrast, just so everything is like clear. I think I will take some of her color choices and you and use those, but I'm going to tweak a lot of stuff too. But um, the color flats are designed for differentiation so it's easy for me to go in there and start like magic wanding and stealing stuff and like quickly being able to grab shapes and change them um but yeah this is what it looks like when when you actually properly do the workflow you're supposed to do which is flat the whole page and then go in and actually like start tweaking and shading but i don't work that way because i get bored flatting is so brutal um but yeah, secret treat. Uh, give me one sec. I'm going to get some water because I'm talking a lot and I need to like refresh my my hydration. And I might grab a, like a quick snack. Um, so give me one sec. I'm literally just going to like mute the mic and, uh, and grab like a glass of water. I'll be gone for like, I don't know two seconds here wait i'll change the i mean maybe like max two minutes give me a sec i'll change the little waiting message to say like something funny hang on i'll be back
Sorry. Hang on. Some of that is good that you didn't hear because I was like talking. I was talking like to somebody else here too, but I'm back. Yeah, sorry. Now I'm actually back. Well, some of what I was saying was not for stream. It was for others. Also, the chewing sounds. How would you show someone mumbling? You know, uh, the My Hero Academia manga has like the really cool, uh, like anytime he talks, it's like in a normal talk bubble, but then he does a lot of like, um, the, what's the main character's name? I can't remember his name. He's, uh, when he talks under his breath, they like take his words out of a talk bubble and they like run it like small near his head. So when he's like talking normally, it's like a, it's like a normal talk bubble. And then when he mumbles, it's like a bunch of little words, not in a bubble. That's like coming, like sometimes it, it goes all uh, around his head, but it's not in a bubble. All right. Thanks Ninja, thanks for being here. Okay. Chewing is over. We'll get back into it. I don't know how much... I'll try to go a little bit longer, but... We'll see how much longer I can go. So I think the secret with this parrotfish is to use it as a way to balance out the, the spirit down here. So however we end up shading her or coloring her... We can use the same techniques here. So I think it's a purple, but let's flip it. Sometimes when I'm coloring, I actually flip the page around so I can see like, I know this is weird, but sometimes it helps me actually color something, especially if it's like upside down, if I flip it around so I can see it correctly. So like, for example, when I get over to this page on the right and I'm shading her head, I probably will end up like actually turning the turning the page like this because it'll actually help me think about it correctly. I don't know why. I think it's just how my brain works. All right, so first things first, we got to do his beak. This is the fun part. This is where you've like flatted the character You've put a little gradient on it, and now you get you get to actually do the fun part, which is like go in and just like start playing with detail. Um, I'm not gonna put, I'm about to put a lot more detail on this parrot than I will on any than I will on anything else on the page because I don't want to get bogged down in detail. But just because he's so close to the camera, uh, I really want him to have like a little bit extra detailing in the coloring, you know? Again, this is gonna look weird, but this is where it gets really fun, where I, I'm i not gonna actually make his beak blue, but I do kind of wanna think of like a real, a real parrot or bird usually has a, like a macaw, for example, has a darker beak than the rest of its body. So I kind of, again, we're not coloring literally, like I'm not doing literal coloring where I'm actually like looking up what color, a, you know, a cockatoo or something like what, what their beak actually is. But I am just in my brain going like, oh yeah, I've seen birds that are like parrots where they're like light colored and their beak is like gray or a little bit darker. So I kind of want to start like just, just imitating 
not going realistic, but imitating what I kind of have in my head of like how this can look. And then I'm just gonna flip through, let me see, I like that. I'm just gonna flip through blending modes. I like that a lot actually. So this is where like I give myself a limited palette, but I give myself the permission to use different blending modes. So like this is on color burn and that actually expands my palette pretty far. Solar does art says, I'm here. <laughs> Hello. What do you do when you have art block, but you need to do your job? Mm. Um, I don't know. Maybe somebody else is more qual. I, I'm going to be totally honest. Oh, did the stream just go down? Oh, I think we just effed. Damn. Well, hopefully you guys can still hear me, but on my end, the stream just went down. If you can, if the stream is broken, type F. If you can still hear and see me, type hello. Okay, cool, I'm here. On my end, the stream just like exploded. Uh, so art block, okay, so I personally have never really suffered from art block, like I'm, I'm always scheming and thinking of like weird, cool things that I can do. Um, but I also do art like across a lot of different mediums, so um, like I make music, for example. So if you're stuck and you can't think of anything to draw, it might actually be worth uh, like playing, doing something creative in a different medium. That's I guess that's maybe, I guess I never really felt like I have art block because if I ever do get stuck somewhere, I just switch to something else. So I'll go go make music, right? And then it's sort of like, you do that and then it kind of like unlocks your brain um, to draw again because you like switched gears so that's what I would say it's like you don't have to actually uh, you don't have to feel like uh, you have to get stuck in one thing you can like reset your brain by going and doing something else if that makes sense So it's it's helpful to have like multiple creative pursuits because I do think that if you're a creative person, if you're a creative person, you you're totally capable of being creative in more than one medium. You know what I mean? Like I think we do a bad job of accepting that. We're always like so astounded when someone can both play the piano and uh, and draw, and I think that's actually like totally normal. I think it's the same creative brain part of your brain. You know what I mean? Um, where can I send you guys a care package? Uh, I don't know. Um, I don't think we're set up for that yet. I gotta, I'm trying to get a new PO box set up. Why don't, um, that's one of the, I'm going to be doing that really soon. Actually, I'm trying to set up a new PO box for when we ship out, um, issue three. And I want to have that done soon. So why don't uh, you, at some point we'll probably announce the PO box. People can start sending, because I know other people have wanted to send us stuff, but um, I want to get the new PO box set up for a new shipping situation when issue three is out. So why don't, uh, just stay tuned, because we'll probably have a PO box people can send stuff to. So yeah, I don't know. I'm just kind of playing around like 
I'm just trying different stuff on this parrot. It's getting a little like shamrock green for my taste. I don't, I don't love how green this got suddenly. Let me see. So the danger, the danger with using a lot of colors like this is it can get like really desaturated really quickly. Hang on. I mean, sorry, really overly saturated really quickly. And, and that's when it kind of starts to look like, I don't know, the only word I can think of is like gross, like Lucky Charms. Like I don't want that Lucky Charms steez, you know what I mean? Like I want some slightly more sophisticated coloring. I think that's already better. It's all just about subtlety and like not overdoing the color choices, you know? And I'll also, I'm gonna try to go in with some purple and shade it out like a little bit with a little bit more variation, but for now I'm just trying to get some shading shapes in and then I'm actually gonna start putting color, different colors into the shading shapes, if that makes sense. I exist, what up? Yeah, Lydia, Lydia's like, what kind of care package? I'm like, Please let it just be like snacks or something. <laughs> Not anything weird. Like a glit. Please don't send us like a glitter bomb. So check this out. I'm gonna do a pretty cool thing. I'm gonna fade the shading layer. So from one color to another. So I've got kind of the beginnings of a shading layer going here where I'm shading with this kind of like teal color. And I'm just like getting the shading shape in, right? And then as, it's, it's a really nice color to shade up here where the green is lighter. As the gradient on the parrot moves down, it gets darker. So this shading color doesn't quite, it's not really a shader anymore. It's not, it's about the same value. Like it doesn't act as a, a color to darken it down. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put a gradient across this shading color and I'm gonna use purple. So I'm just gonna put a clipping mask and I'm gonna do, I'm gonna fade it from green to purple. And now as I shade, it'll be purple down here and green up here. So it always feels like it's like darkening down the areas that I'm coloring in. I love doing that. That's a very like James Stoko technique is the, uh, the color fade but just a color fade in the shadows, not across the whole character or object itself. So 
So then you can go in and put gradients in like this that take it to purple in certain parts. Just some, and again, it's really simple. It's just one gradient sitting on top of, of the layer. So anything I paint is going to conform to that gradient. You know what I mean? And then I can go back in with an eraser and I can erase out pieces of it for highlights. And it'll go back to green because that's like the base layer underneath. So I can do like feather detailing like this. Let me zoom in. And it's subtle, but where the gradient is green, the erasing won't be as obvious. And where the gradient is purple, it's going to be like super obvious. But all I'm doing is just erasing out this top gradient. Just trying to get some detail back. And that's where you get like some cool, quick, sophisticated effects, you know? You can see the beginnings of it. And then I have to make sure that I zoom out and just check how it looks on the page. The one danger here is that the green on his beak is completely unique. Like it's not anywhere else on this page. So it in maybe not a super good way looks like really, it stands out. So I could try to like knock it back to a little bit more yellow because that's more the colors. The color scheme of the greens down here is actually a little bit leaning more yellow. So as I'm working on this parrot, I may want to just like throw a yellow gradient on it and just try to take it back to my color story a little bit. Oh, that's pretty cool. And then I'll just like, again, cycle through some blending modes just to see how it's affected. And it just, I mean, it's crazy, like, how much it changes the vibe each time. I like that one. <clears throat> There's just so much you can do. You know what I mean? Like, you can sit here and just, like, fiddle with blending modes all day and just try different things. see I think I think the danger is just going to teal it just doesn't fit my color story if you look at my palette here all the greens are in this like more like yellowy minty like mint green or yellow green so I'm gonna maybe just have to like even though I like this teal color a lot I might have to just like break up with it a little bit So I might just do this and literally just paint bucket a new color over it. Oops. I'll set my like paint paint bucket opacity like 20%. And yeah, that's better. I think that's better. It it it's getting there. It's it's starting to feel now like these two really the thing I'm just checking is to make sure that whatever I'm doing with the parrot up here is consistent to the vibe of her down here. And I'm gonna use both shading techniques and gradient techniques and everything on both of them so that they really like match. Because if you go too crazy and make one object too different, it's just like, it's never gonna, your page will never feel cohesive, you know what I mean? Oh, nice, we inspired you to buy calligraphy pens. That's so awesome. 
That's like, I feel like that's like a big deal, right? Like, that's not a purchase that you normally think to do, right? You'd have to really want to do it to uh, to buy them. So that I'm, I'm honored. It's not something that you buy unless you're really like trying to do art. You know what I mean? So yeah, I'm just kind of, I don't know. I'm just kind of like making simple shading choices. And see before, again, this, there's really subtle stuff going on. So I'm turning on and off a layer. If you look at the bottom beak, you can see like a little bit of a gradient turning on and off. And this is why color is so contextual. When I first started on this, I really liked that little gradient fade on his beak. Now I hate it because because of where I ended up, I I don't I want there to be a harder edge. Like see how up on the top of his beak, there's like a harder edge to this shading because his beak is light and the shading is darker against it. The problem with this gradient here is that when it's on, you can't see the edges of the shading. So I'm actually going to turn the turn, just turn it off. I'm just going to delete it. I thought I liked it, and now that I've kind of like established my color a little bit, I I, I don't want it. You know. It's just all about like trying to work in a way where you're making contextual choices. You know. It's getting there though. I mean, you can see. Let's give him. Uh, let's give him some cool uh, like Gatorade eyes. I think his eyes really need to be like this lime color, like really intense. Let me uh, just make a new. I'll just make a new layer called Parrot Detailing. Or maybe yellow. Like I really, for some reason, I feel like his eye could be like really freaky. Like, what if it's like this orange color? Yeah, yeah, it's like the color of the cracker. Yeah, that looks cool. That's really cool. I like that a lot. And then, yeah, you can see how there's enough similar colors where these two characters on the top and bottom like actually have like a they mesh, you know what I mean? Like it gives a sense of like an overall intent to the page. It's cool, I like it a lot. I like the, I like, I like where this page is going. I think it's feeling rainbow, but not like Lucky Charms explosion. It feels like everything is like a little bit mindful. Like, you know what I mean? Like there's some thought behind stuff. Weirdly, I didn't like the this middle panel here, uh, where is it here? This middle panel, I didn't love the red for the ship, but I actually, it's so, again, color is so contextual. Cause like if I sample this color, check it out. Like, look at this color. It's so red. And yet in the context of everything else, this dark red is almost like, it's almost like a neutral. Do you know what I mean? Like it's, if you if you make this ship red on a pink background, you, you don't really notice it as much because there's so many other colors on the page. And that's that's what's really wild about color is like how contextual it is. Because I could also use this red in a, this exact same color in a different context with a different set of colors around it, and it would be the brightest, most intense thing on the page. But it's like a neutral in this context. It's so crazy. Actually, I would love to shade the the edge of this cube or rectangle here, this color. So watch this. 
just for like a little bit of 3D effect that's not going to be distracting. It'll just give it some shading, but it because this red is kind of a neutral, a neutral on this page in this context, it's like not really going to read as something that catches your eye. It's just going to read as like depth. You know what I mean? Like super subtle. But if I turn the lines off, oh, Photoshop is dying. It doesn't like that. Yeah. If I turn the lines off, you can see that that like this red color just gives it a little bit of like shading and uh, and yet it really doesn't distract you. This looks wild with the lines off. Look at that. It's cool. I like it. Oh man, I'm so relieved. That parrot, I feel like, is proving to me that this is going to work. I, it was a little, when the parrot was all green, I was a little worried about it because it was it was reading like just this random green shape, but it, it's starting to really work. And there can be like a lot of green, like maybe her head, maybe this middle panel here, her head is like green. You know what I mean? Just to just to give it some, and it'll be on kind of a purpley background. That might look really cool if if her head is green as like a way to balance that. Because again, this is the spread you're looking at. It'll balance out like the composition of everything. Oh my God, save your file. Did I remember to save my file? Probably not. Yeah, it's been a while since I saved. I'm really glad that you said that. All right, I think uh, I think that does it. I gotta feed my dog. I just wanted to make some progress that was, uh, I weirdly feel like we did a lot and yet didn't make any progress. But I think if I actually look back at the beginning, like I think if you watch the beginning of this VOD, you'll see that we actually made a lot of, uh, a lot of progress. Yeah, I like the red ship too. I think, I think it's, I think it's working. And it probably could be a red ship in the on the right too. I think it'll all work. Tell the dog chat says hi. Where, where is my dog? She's close by, but I don't want to grab her and disturb her nap. Um, cool. Does anybody have any last uh questions before we sign off otherwise i'll play you out with the interdimensional soundtrack yeah we also uh, we also have a cat yeah we have a cat and a dog it's an it's astounding that the cat has not made an appearance on this stream all right i'll play you out with uh we'll do some uh We'll do the Hotel of Dreams song, the song that uh, I wrote about this uh, this issue. So there you go. We'll, I'll play you out with uh, I'll play you out with uh, with a song that I wrote that will I'll be available as a soundtrack on cassette tape that you can listen to while you read the printed edition of our comics. You have a fully analog immersive soundtrack experience. Um, would getting a tablet for art be a good investment? Yes, but if you're just starting, it may it's a little bit more expensive, but it may be worth looking into an iPad with an Apple pencil. It depends on you may you may want to try see if you can without paying for it, like see if you can go to an Apple store and let them like try a an iPad with a with an Apple pencil to see if you like drawing directly on the screen or if you want to use a tablet uh that might be separate from the screen. But it, you need something with one of these, like a stylus or a pen or an Apple Pencil or something, like in order to do digital art in any kind of meaningful way. So I, um, I definitely recommend getting something that gives you this. But remember, Wacom tablets, there's a used market for them. 
and uh, you can get like way better prices buying Wacom's used uh, than new because people are always upgrading like they're always getting the next best tablet or like a new Wacom with a screen on it and they'll sell their old like Cintiq or whatever so you can get good deals used just remember that alright cool I'll play you out on uh, Hotel of Dreams from the Interdimensional 3 soundtrack soon to be available on cassette tape near you um, bye everybody this was really fun um, we'll see you again soon thank you alright I'm starting the song now I'm trying to time this like a DJ bye